So thank you and welcome again to this webinar to launch BankTrack's Human Rights Benchmark 2022, which was launched last week on Thursday. Thanks everyone for, for joining. We've had uh, over 200 people, I think, registered for uh, the two webinars that, uh, that we're holding. This is, uh, this is the early shift for us to enable attendees from different time zones. Uh, we've had people register from, from the banking sector, from investors, civil society, consultants. It's really good to be able to welcome uh, such, a, such a large crowd. My name is Ryan Brightwell. I coordinate BankTrack's human rights work. I'm joined by my colleague, Julia Barbos, who is the report's lead author. Uh, BankTrack, to introduce our organization briefly, is a tracking, campaigning and civil society uh, support organization working on private sector banks. Um, and our mission, our new mission introduced in January of this year is to challenge commercial banks to act urgently and decisively on four interrelated global emergencies. So the accelerating climate crisis, the ongoing destruction of nature, the risk of ever more pandemics and the widespread violation of human rights. Today we're here to talk about Benchmark, which is of course part of our human rights campaign work stream. And before Julia presents the results of the benchmark, I'm gonna put things in some context by talking a bit about our human rights campaign and its history. Uh, so since the UN guiding principles were endorsed in 2011, the focus of our human rights campaign has been on advocating for their full implementation by the banking sector not because we think the UNGPs are perfect, but because they're the best framework that we have and we consider that full implementation of them by the banking sector would lead to better outcomes for rights holders than we have now. Benchmarking banks uh, on their implementation of the guiding principles is a core stream of our work, but it's not the only aspect of our work on human rights. We also campaign on what we term dodgy deals, which are companies and projects with severe adverse environmental and social impacts. And we engage with banks and sector initiatives, including the OECD process on responsible business conduct in the finance sector, for which we're an advisory group member, which uh, released its, uh, its final paper on project and asset finance uh, earlier this week, uh, and also engaging with uh, initiatives like the Equator Principles and the Principles for Responsible Banking. So talk a bit more about the history of our benchmarking work on human rights. Our first benchmark came out in 2014 under the title of Banking with Principles. Uh, and this followed three years after the guiding principles were endorsed where there have been a number of discussions about, about what they mean for the banking sector. For example, at the Tung Group, although these discussions were useful, several questions were still left unanswered around remedy, and we felt that important as these discussions are, it was time to ensure there's a focus on the work of implementing the principles as well. And that's been a key reason for continuing to produce this benchmark, to keep the focus on implementation. We updated the benchmark in 2016 and 2019, extending it from 32 banks at first to 45 uh, and then 50 banks. And in 2021 and also earlier this year, we also published regional benchmarks assessing larger second tier banks headquartered in Africa and Asia respectively. And also last year we published a report called Action Speak Louder, which assesses how banks respond to specific allegations of adverse human rights impacts. And our new benchmark incorporates an update to this research, which extends that analysis, which Julia will present shortly. So aside from this benchmarking work, we've also published a series of briefings on specific policy areas of relevance to banks and human rights. These include uh, how banks contribute to human rights abuses in 2017, setting out eight cases where we considered a strong argument could be made that banks had contributed to adverse human rights impacts through their finance, rather than only being directly linked in the language of the guiding principles a publication called Developing Effective Grievance Mechanisms in the Banking Sector in 2018 with Oxfam Australia, setting out how and why banks should meet the responsibility to provide effective grievance mechanisms for those affected by their finance. 
and a paper called We're Unable to Comment on Specific Customers uh, in 2019, setting out how banks can in fact overcome the hurdle of client confidentiality, uh, and which makes the case for a much more transparent banking sector. And you can find all of these uh, reports linked to on our website. Also worth highlighting uh, is that we've sought advice on two occasions from the OHCHR, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on specific questions around implementation of the UN guiding principles in the banking sector in an effort to resolve matters where there was either a lack of clarity or a disagreement. This has led to two very valuable guidance notes from, uh, from the UN covering questions around when banks might contribute to human rights abuses, their responsibilities when it comes to access to remedy and the establishment of grievance mechanisms. Uh, and in the, the more recent guidance note, uh, the responsibilities of banks and other investors when it comes to their role as nominee shareholders or custodians of shares. And this advice has been vital in clarifying the sector's responsibilities and very influential in informing much of the guidance that's followed, including those papers from the, uh, from the OECD. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about the, the context in which we released this report. And it occurred to me that an interesting lens through which to, to look at this context is, is to talk about some of the coalitions that we have, have joined and that we in the human rights team at BankTrack have started working with in the, in the past couple of years. Because these shed light on some current important topics in, in the banking sector. Um, firstly, we've joined the Justice is Everybody's Business uh, campaign. One conclusion of our last global benchmark in 2019 was that there's, there's a clear argument for legislation to compel banks and other companies to conduct human rights due diligence. And there's now a process going through in the European Union to develop the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive which is currently on its sixth draft. And we've joined the Justice is Everybody's Business campaign to call for this law to be strong and comprehensive, particularly in its coverage of the finance sector, which is uh, not yet the case with the current draft, unfortunately. We're also a member of the, the Don't Buy Into Occupation Coalition, which is working to expose the links between, um, between companies involved in supporting the illegal, the illegal settlement enterprise in the occupied Palestinian territories and European financial institutions. And its second report is uh, coming out next week. Also on the topic of enabling, uh, or companies that are enabling uh, state-backed human rights violations, I suppose, we've joined the Business for Ukraine coalition, which aims to block access to the economic and financial resources enabling Russian aggression in Ukraine. As part of this work, we've called on banks to leave Russia and to cease financing companies that are providing strategic support to the Russian state, including in the oil and gas sector. Uh, and finally, we're a founding member of the Stop ECOP coalition. And we've led that coalition's advocacy towards private sector banks, which has resulted in the past couple of years in 24 banks, virtually the entire American, European and South African banking sector, rejecting Total's plans to construct the world's longest heated pipeline through Uganda and Tanzania. Uh, this is a project that's already associated with serious human rights violations, as well as alarming risks to, to national parks, forests, animals, and the climate. And it's, uh, it's a campaign that particularly underlines how, how the, the four crises that we face are really interrelated. And the final point I wanted to make on the subject of the, the wider context into which we're releasing this report before I pass over to Julia, is that last year, of course, saw the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles, and the UN published two reports marking that anniversary. The first, taking stock of what's been achieved so far and what, uh, what's not yet been achieved, and the second, setting out the roadmap on the way forward. And the, the stock taking report actually referenced our 2019 human rights benchmark uh, in pointing to what it characterized as slow movement among the finance sector as a whole, although other parts of the sector like private equity and venture capital lag still further behind than the banks. And following the stock taking, the UN published its roadmap for the next 10 years, leading with a call to raise the ambition and increase the pace of realizing business respect for human rights. <clears throat> 
And there are specific recommendations in this uh, UNGPs plus 10 roadmap aimed at the finance sector. Uh, it calls on actors uh, in the finance sector, including banks, of course, to adopt policies, uh, due diligence and grievance processes on human rights, to promote better practice among their clients and investee companies, and to publicly disclose how their salient human rights risks and impacts are being addressed. So the UN has raised concerns about this slow pace of change and has set banks a priority list. And it's now over to Julia to talk about the extent to which banks are acting on this, uh, as revealed by this year's benchmark results. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for this overview and for putting into context um, our work on the benchmark. Um, so this report, first of all, culminates um, eight months of work. So it's so great to finally see it published and to see so many of you attend this webinar today. I will start by giving a brief presentation um, overview of the methodology before I move <clears throat> into the benchmarks results more in detail. Um, so as in 2019, the scope of this report included 50 banks. Uh, we selected the largest banks by assets under management um, and removed those without substantial involvement in commercial banking. We also made adjustments for geographical balance. For example, 13 of the largest banks in the world are from China, but we only included um, the three largest. And then we added other banks as the largest banks in Latin America uh, for better regional balance. We assessed banks against 14 criteria based closely on the text of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. These 14 criteria were divided into four categories, looking at uh, banks' human rights policies, the processes for human rights due diligence, their reporting on human rights, uh, as well as um, their approaches to remedy, including grievance mechanisms. We gave a score of one, 0 0.5 or zero against each criteria, leading to a total uh, of 14 available points. And then we ranked banks from laggards to leaders uh, from the lowest to the highest scoring. Uh, this year, we also added a new criteria in a fifth category, assessing banks' responses to specific adverse human rights impacts raised by civil society and communities. Um, these three additional criteria also received a score of zero, uh, 0 0.5 or one each, and then they were averaged leading to an overall score of between um, one and three for each bank. Um, as these scores are presented as an average uh, and are not available for every bank, they are presented separately uh, and are not added to the results of categories one to four. Um, moving slide. Um, so to start off this process, we informed the banks in scope in May, uh, following which we scored the banks during the whole month of June. Um, we then sent contacts at each bank, their draft scores, and every, each bank was given three weeks to provide feedback, and uh, we allowed extensions when requested. Uh, we also sent a news alert over our mailing list on, on our website to ensure banks were aware of the process. Uh, where we may have not had the right contacts uh, for the banks in scope. Uh, during the feedback pre period, we received um, an unprecedented number um, of responses from banks. 36 out of 50 banks uh, submitted comments on their draft scores, and a further two um, responded to say that they had no comments. Um, in 2019, only 29 banks responded, so this is uh, this was very nice to see. Um, we also worked, as in 2019, with an independent academic advisory panel. This was comprised of three uh, academics working on business and human rights, who were Joanne Bauer at Columbia University, Nadia Bernas at Wageningen University, and Kim Sheehan at the University of Newcastle in Australia, um, whom I'd like to take this opportunity to thank so much for their time and, and advice. Um, we sent our panel a set of 13 difficult or uh, finally balanced scoring decisions covering 12 banks. And then panelists were asked uh, to indicate which score they would award and um, provide further comments where appropriate. Uh, after this process, we finalized the scores uh, based both on bank feedback and uh, input from the academic panel and then uh, we wrote the report and published it last week, as Ryan already mentioned. Um, 
this year, we published Bank's results and our rationale uh, for each scoring decision together with uh, the comments we received from banks and our responses to them on a series of 15 individual um, web pages, which are all linked in the report and uh, are publicly available. Uh, since our last uh, benchmark in 2019, we also um, made some changes to the methodology. So uh, first of all, uh, following a period of consultation with experts in the field, um, we have changed some of the wording for some of our existing criteria. And this was done mostly to enhance clarity and better define requirements. So for instance, uh, on the criteria, assessing due diligence, we have added the word ongoing so that for a full score, a bank would have to show that its due diligence uh, process is not only limited to the onboarding stage of a relationship. Um, other changes such as this one uh, can be found in the methodology section of the report. Secondly, we slightly adjusted the boundaries for the laggards to leaders categories. Um, while the category of laggards was left the same, um, we raised the bar for the level of performance required uh, for higher categories. This was done for two reasons. Um, firstly, to absorb the two, the two new criteria that we had added back in 2019 into these boundaries. And secondly, to reflect the need for increased ambition from the sector as flagged by the UN's roadmap, um, also previously mentioned by, by Ryan. And lastly, um, from our conversations with banks, we heard that there was an appetite for more examples of good practice which can provide clear guidance and can be helpful to improve practices. So we highlighted uh, good practice examples throughout the report, hoping that this will be a helpful addition. Um, I will now quickly introduce our key findings and then I will move into the results for each category. Um, so this year, our headline finding is that 11 years since the unanimous adoption of the UN guiding principles, no bank shows an adequate level of implementation. In fact, of the 50 banks scored, 38 achieved a score of less than seven out of 14 available points, indicating that they're implementing less than half of their responsibilities under the guiding principles. The report also finds that there are no leaders, uh, meaning uh, no bank scored higher than nine points out of 14. And the top performers uh, were Citi, Mizuho, and Westpac, uh, all three with nine points. And among the poorest performers scoring three points or less, we had Goldman Sachs, uh, JP Morgan Chase, DZ Bank, Commerce Bank, uh, BPCE Group, and all the Chinese banks that were assessed. Um, there have also been some, some modest improvements since 2019. For instance, the average score uh, increased from four to five out of 14. So on average, um, banks achieved 36% of all available points uh, as compared to uh, only 28% in 2019. Uh, this overall improvement can also, uh, also shows in the number of banks that increased their score. Uh, compared to 2019, 33 out of 50 banks did better, uh, and some increased their score quite significantly uh, by three points or more. And this includes Mizuho, Bank of America, Societe Generale, and TD Bank. As a result of this, um, we see that many more banks were ranked as uh, followers and less as laggards when compared to 2019. Another positive finding is that by now banks have largely developed human rights uh, policy statements. 42 out of 50, that's 84%, um, have a statement of policy on human rights in place already. And uh, another um, improvement uh, was that um, the, the whole of the category, category assessing due diligence um, showed uh, improvement. So for instance, I think uh, 27 banks improved their, their score by at least half a point on at least one of the five um, criteria included in the due diligence category. We also have some not so positive uh, findings. Um, and in terms of human rights reporting, for instance, virtually 
nothing has changed since our last benchmark in 2019. The large majority of banks still does not openly address human rights uh, as an area of reporting and or discusses broader areas of risk as opposed to specific impacts, for example. Remedy also remains an underdeveloped area. Only two out of 50 banks uh, have uh, grievance mechanisms to date. Uh, and finally, our new assessment category on response tracking finds that banks are usually evasive and when approached regarding specific human rights violations, uh, they fail to provide a constructive response um, three quarters of the time. Um, with the remaining time available, I will give a quick overview <clears throat> of the results breakdown for criteria. So here we're looking at the three requirements for category one on policy, uh, which assess whether a bank has a policy in place, a human rights policy in place, whether this is approved at the highest level of business and whether it has a broad scope uh, that includes all impacts uh, of a bank's finance. We see that for most banks now uh, have a human rights policy that includes a clear commit commitment to respect human rights. Uh, this makes 1.1 the benchmark requirement on which banks uh, scored most strongly. We also found that uh, 26 banks have updated their human rights poli policies since 2019 and three banks have developed their first ever. On policy approval, 17 banks show that their human rights policies are both approved at the highest level of business, that is by the board of directors or by the CEO, and that a member um, or committee of the board of directors has direct oversight over human rights issues. Another 17 banks uh, achieved a half score where human rights commitments were signed off at the highest level of the business, but no board level uh, oversight of human rights was in place or vice versa. Um, I will say that this is one of the criteria um, on our benchmark where we received most comments and questions from banks. Um, crucially, the requirement for a full score uh, here calls for governance oversight at the board of directors level, as opposed to the bank's executive. And we've done so to align um, our requirement um, with, the, with that of the corporate human rights benchmark. Um, lastly, 28 out of 50 banks or 56% explicitly indicate in their policies um, that their commitment to respect human rights extends to the entirety of their business, including their lending, uh, asset management, and bond underwriting. Uh, while this figure is up from 22 banks in 2019, uh, there is still a considerable number of banks that fall short uh, of making this clear in their disclosures. In this section, we look at the first three criteria on due diligence, and then in the next slide, we will look at the remaining two. So the largest group of banks scored a half point for the first criteria here, um, indicating that they have human rights due diligence processes um, in place, but these were limited in scope or poorly described. Um, however, 18 banks also uh, achieved a full score, and uh, this is because they indicated that they effectively carry out human rights due diligence throughout the entirety of their operations and on an ongoing basis. As in 2019, 2.2 uh, on consultation remains a major gap. Um, no bank achieved the requirement for a full score. A silver lining is that um, an increasing number of banks is doing more on this front um, with 22 achieving at least a half score. And this is compared to only 11 in, in 2019. Um, so this shows that there is increased awareness among banks of the importance of meaningful stakeholder consultation. Banks that achieved um, a half score typically described approaches to due diligence where the views of different stakeholders, such as um, trade unions, NGOs, or academics um, were sought on a ad hoc basis. Um, however, our research also finds that little to no attention is given to actual rights holders on the ground. So, for example, only three banks were found to include considerations on human rights defenders in their policies, and an additional two included um, considerations on indigenous peoples more specifically. 
in terms of allocating responsibility, uh, this is also an area that um, still needs some improvement. Uh, the majority of banks here still does not explicitly indicate who is responsible for what uh, when it comes to, to human rights due diligence. As you can see here, um, there are still quite some big uh, red bars showing for our remaining due diligence criteria. 78% of banks still fails to indicate whether they have a process at all for assessing whether they cause or they contribute um, to an impact via their finance. However, 11 banks compared to only four in, in 2019 um, do indicate in their disclosures that they have such a process in place, but they uh, fell short of describing it. Um, this is one of the most important areas of, of, of due diligence um, that urges, urgently needs improvement. Um, if banks are to play a role in remedy, they need to have a process for assessing whether they contribute to, to impacts. Um, for tracking effectiveness, while not immediately clear, um, there have also been some small improvements. Uh, this year, 17 banks scored um, a half score. This is compared to only six in 2019, and uh, banks typically provided some elements uh, of a process for tracking the effectiveness of, of their actions. Um, and, but also for the first time in the in the history of our benchmark, one bank uh, city scored a full a full point. Now on reporting, um, well, most banks reporting um, still is critically underdeveloped. In most cases, this is limited to basic reporting on policy updates or on trainings, and 36 banks scored a half point for this level of, of human rights reporting. Only eight banks formally assess their main human rights impacts and uh, the steps that they've taken to, to address these. Um, banks are also particularly poor reporting uh, on specific impacts. So uh, most banks did not mention specific adverse impacts at all. Despite uh, on our benchmark, there is uh, quite a low minimum standard to achieve a score here. Uh, we reward a score um, where at least one significant example is, is made. Um, three banks, Nordia, UBS, and Standard Chartered, described specific instances sufficiently to show that uh, their actions were adequate to respond to the issues identified. And then in terms of uh, human rights indicators, an increasing number of banks, that's 21 uh, out of 50, compared to just 13 in 2019, um, are including them in the reporting, although in all but one case, and that's Rabobank, um, they do not relate to the bank's main human rights impacts. Um, enabling access to remedy and the related question of presence of grievance mechanisms is the lowest scoring area of our benchmark. Um, our criterion for a full score on 4.1 was revised this year um, so that banks would receive a full score um, either for detailing a process uh, for remedying adverse impacts were appropriate, or for providing at least one example of how they have done so in the past. And despite um, these changes, which were made to make a full score easier to achieve, um, no, no bank uh, achieved the full score here. Um, since 2019, ANZ launched its very own grievance mechanism for human rights complaints um, associated with its corporate lending. And this followed the decision by the Australian OECD National Contact Point, which recommended the bank to develop a grievance mechanism to comply with the OECD guidelines. Um, this decision sets the standard for the whole industry. And ANZ's grievance mechanism is to date the, the most well-developed. Australia's National Australia Bank also has a grievance mechanism and ABN AMRO has disclosed that it is currently working to develop one. But otherwise, as we see in our results, uh, other banks are not yet following suit. Lastly, coming to our new category, 
assessing banks' responses to specific human rights allegations. Uh, our research builds on our um, initial assessment made in 2021 in the Actions Speak Louder report, uh, where we assessed 38 banks on 90 inquiries covering nine issues. In this report, uh, 47 banks in the scope of this benchmark were contacted 152 times on 13 specific allegations. And the four additional cases are listed here um, on the slide. On average, this means that um, each bank was contacted three times, although the amount of times each bank um, has been contacted really varies between uh, just once and eight times. There were also three banks um, that were not contacted at all, and these were State Bank of India, Kaisha Bank, and Itaú Nibanku. Um, and here for the results, so our fifth category, um, well, the first requirement looks at whether a bank responded publicly and in sufficient detail uh, to the allegations raised. And we found that the vast majority did not. 40, 41 out of 47 banks uh, achieved uh, low average scores of 0 0.3 or less. Um, scores are averaged here across uh, each time um, a bank was approached to respond. ING Group was the bank with the highest score, although it was assessed on only two responses. Uh, it responded and acknowledged its link to impact um, in both cases. And in one case, detailed its engagement with its client. Societe Generale, ANZ, ANZ and DZ Bank re received the, the, the next highest scores with an average of 0 0.5. Average scores on each uh, on action taken in response to specific impacts were even lower. Um, 15 banks scored above zero on average, indicating that they had set out um, some action taken in response to an impact um, on at least one occasion. However, in all but two cases, the average score was 0 0.3 or less. Um, on monitoring, um, no bank has yet scored, as we can see. Uh, in 35 of the 150 uh, inquiries made, banks were not scored because the impact was raised less than one year ago. And in the remaining cases, no information on whether the bank um, monitored the progress of um, the client or the investee's uh, company's action or its own action um, were, were provided. Overall, our response tracking scores uh, often provide a counterpoint to the other scores in the benchmark. Um, so even banks that are scoring well, say on policy or in due diligence uh, or even on reporting, typically uh, are failing to show how they are taking action to address actual impacts on the ground when impacts, uh, sorry, when these impacts are raised by civil society or uh, communities. Um, to sum up, I think this chart uh, helps to visualize um, the number of banks scoring half and full points per category and to identify worrying gaps in the performance on, of banks in most of the requirements, particularly towards uh, the bottom half uh, of the chart. And finally, to address the areas that need improvement, we have developed some key um, demands for all banks. In particular, we would like to stress that human rights due diligence um, can only be effective if those that are the most affected are consulted with. To better inform their decision-making and uh, investment practices, banks need to take into account the perspectives and experiences of rights holders, and this is essential. Secondly, we need banks to be working with their clients to make sure adverse impacts are addressed. And we need banks to talk more about um, how they've done this. This is a core part of the UNGP's framework. And if banks get it right, they have a good story, a good story to tell. Um, and this is also to show that you know, policy commitments are not just paper tigers, but they actually reflect into good action and and good practice. Um, thirdly, um, developing grievance mechanisms is the most concrete avenue for accountability 
and for banks to show that they understand their, their responsibility to respect human rights. And it's also imperative that banks respond constructively when, when and speak to the subject matter when, when contacted uh, regarding human rights uh, allegations. Finally, banks um, need to play a more active role in supporting effective legislation. As many nations uh, are currently working on developing mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence rules, and as the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive is uh, currently being um, debated in both the EU Council and Parliament um, and as object of fierce lobbying, it is imperative that uh, banks get ahead of the curve and engage with lawmakers where appropriate um, to ensure that laws are uh, effective and build upon existing standards as outlined in international frameworks such as the, the UN guiding principles. And this is also to ensure that future legislation does not undermine years of, of good practice and lower standards that many in the industry are already implementing. This year's benchmark, um, the results of this year's benchmark reaffirm, um, given the slow progress of banks towards full implementation of their human rights responsibilities and the significant gaps that, that we've seen today, that strong legislation um, covering the whole of the financial sector is urgently needed and to ensure better outcomes for, for people and, and for the planet. Um, yeah, that was our presentation. So thank you so much um, for bearing with us uh, to, to this point. Um, for those curious, we plan to repeat our assessment um, of global banks every two years, subject to, to funding. And we also intend to continue um, with our regional benchmarks, having already released two, one focusing on uh, Asia and the other one on Africa. Um, I hope that this information was helpful and of course if you have any feedback or comments uh, please um, either you know here in the chat or if you would like to contact any of us later via email and lastly for those of you who uh, will be attending the UN forum in Geneva next week um, I also welcome the opportunity to connecting at the event and discussing this and more um, in person. So thank you again, and I will now open the floor to questions. And just as a reminder, the second part of this webinar is not recorded. Thanks, Julia, for the excellent presentation. So we're going to stop the recording now and go into the Q&A. Thank you, stopping the recording.